So this is the uh, ESIP Federation uh, uh, Drupal Working Group uh, November call, and uh, we are getting ready for the uh, ESIP Winter Meeting in BC uh, the second week in uh, in January. Um, so if you're an ESIP member, uh, we hope to see you there. Uh, we'll have a business meeting, and we, uh, we will be uh, uh, holding elections for the chair of the working group and uh, also doing some business, including uh, trying to decide who gets funded uh, by ESIP to go to DrupalCon in Austin. And uh, we're starting up some uh, uh, programming for the, the Science Discovery Service. And, and uh, so we're, we're really interested in people who want to work on that. And uh, uh, we are... Um, very uh, happy today to welcome back uh, Phase 2. Phase 2 did a call uh, uh, about a year and a half ago, and uh, uh, we're glad to have them back now to talk about uh, uh, Open Atrium version 2.0. So, uh, uh, Mike, you want to uh, uh, you want to take over? Sure, I'll actually let uh, Karen uh, get started here. Okay. Hi guys, uh, my name is Karen Borchert and I'm the VP of Strategic Initiatives at Phase 2 and I oversee our, our products uh, section of our, of our company and um, with me is Mike Potter who is our Open Atrium Lead Architect at Phase 2 and really the brains behind this operation. Um, and we're here to talk a little bit about Open Atrium 2 today and just kind of tell you what's in it and what it's all about and how um, how you might see it um, in use, and then we can um, also discuss it and talk through any questions that you might have about how it's used or what's in it um, after that. So um, we'll just start with, with what is Open Atrium, and um, Open Atrium is open source collaboration software, and it's used uh, primarily to build internet portals and collaboration platforms for organizations. Um, for those of you who have been in the Drupal community for a while, you may um, remember Open Atrium 1, uh, which was a, a pretty distinctive uh, distribution of Drupal code um, in its time a few years ago, uh, started by the gentleman over at Development Seed, uh, a good, a good um, friends of ours and a, one, of the, one of the teams we've collaborated with um, quite a lot over the years. We took over maintainership of that distribution um, a couple of years ago and then completely re-architected and, re and rebuilt it on Drupal 7 um, over the past year. So just about a year ago at Bad Camp, um, Mike Potter uh, hosted a boss at Bad Camp to, to get uh, interest and show a new architecture. And over the past year, we've been working to implement that, um, that new vision for Open Atrium. So now um, Open Atrium has a, a pretty new feature set. Um, that is that, that's more robust than Open Atrium One. Um, obviously, there are the basic things that Open Atrium or that any kind of intranet or social collaboration software will do, things like uh, documents and events and discussions. Um, but Open Atrium also comes um, with multimedia um, standard. Um, it is completely mobile op optimized with uh, responsive themes throughout. Um, it has a work tracker that was contributed by. Um, a great member of our community who has has uh, built and developed a work tracker for Open Atrium, similar to the case tracker in Open Atrium One, if you're familiar. Um, and then quite a lot of other features that that uh, Mike's going to talk through in much more detail. Um, probably one of the most important of which is um, our data security and identity management, and the ability for Open Atrium to create um, collaboration spaces and uh, sharing spaces on an internet um, that are extremely uh, controllable for security and for uh, for data security in terms of in terms of who can view and and um, who can be a part of each of those spaces at a very granular level. Um, so in addition to those, there's you know activity streams and workflow notifications, tags and taxonomies, um, and then some really great tools that are coming um, around learning and social tools, um, the ability to create my, microsites. Um, and the ability to customize the dashboard, customize the look and feel, uh, and even create and customize um, tutorials and tours that take people around um, that intranet or collaboration site and really teach them how to use it right in line with the tool. Um, so we're really excited about, about the project. It's been 
Um, it's been really exciting to see it start to come to life. We've worked on it with a couple of, of clients and are now working on it with some more enterprise level um, teams who are implementing uh, larger scale intranets with it as well. Um, so the, the basics of it are just like uh, just like any other Drupal code. It's a, it's a distribution of Drupal code, open source, uh, completely Drupal through and through. It is free to download uh, for anyone at the, at the project site which is just at Drupal.org uh, project open atrium. And then uh, it, obviously installing the code from Drupal requires some technical knowledge and an understanding of Drupal, although most of, uh, most of you guys here probably already know that and have that. Um, less technical teams, um, if, they're, you know, if there are other teams uh, on, on or listening, um, you can try out um, Open Atrium in a hosted environment, um, such as Pantheon. Um, you, can, you can actually get a, a really quick uh, install and spin up at getpantheon.com. And obviously, um, it, it, Open Atrium is, you know, it, it is a Drupal code distribution. It requires um, some developer um, knowledge to use or customize it. So um, that's that's just sort of the disclaimer we always put out there around Open Atrium. Um, so the the good thing about Open Atrium and and what what we're really excited about is just how flexible it is and how many ways you can use it. Um, so we wanted to show you a couple of um, a couple of ideas and and, and things of, of how we really see Open Atrium being used um, as we go forward. So um, there are a few different use cases. Um, the first one would be something like an extensible intranet. Um, so you can really efficiently and securely connect with colleagues and teams, um, keep people informed of news and events and resources, um, and just really have a full suite of knowledge management and communication tools. So you can see in this um, there are opportunities for you know, recent activity and news as well as a way to keep track of events um, and track information um, not only geographically you know, by regions or stores uh, but also by, by teams um, and, and roles like the executive team and that kind of thing. Um, this, is, this is proving to be a very popular use case of Open Atrium right off the bat which is, which is what we expected um, and, and you'll see a lot of, of, uh, of that going forward. Um, the second way we really see people using it is as a social collaboration platform. So the ability to, you know, for something like this where a government uh, system, either a state or a local government, may want to provide a way for constituents across the area to connect with their government officials, submit their ideas and concerns, um, provide some ideation, um, and then all with that, you know, the ability to provide that with uh, robust multimedia and again, an events calendar and activity streams um, really helps this be a, a real platform for social collaboration uh, for, for constituents, for employees, for uh, organization members, so forth. So this can be a really public facing version of a site. Um, knowledge management, uh, this is something that's really important um, in, in uh, Open Atrium as a, as a um, capability. Um, we actually have all of our Open Atrium documentation um, on an Open Atrium powered site uh, that's at docs.openatrium.com, and that's, that's a picture of it here. And this, is, uh, open, this allows you to you know, store documents, multimedia, um, really helpful because you can access it on absolutely anything, you know, tablet, mobile, uh, et cetera. Um, and really good data privacy, again, so the ability to, to have knowledge uh, management that you can uh, protect to certain groups for certain pieces of, of, of knowledge um, and, and documents and then, and then expand out to a much wider audience for other things um, is, is really key to the, to the features here. Um, and then the next is you know something we haven't seen necessarily with Open Atrium in the past um, is to really start to branch out its capabilities for learning management. Um, so the ability for a college or university or even a corporate training program to engage users in trainings and classes and knowledge sharing um, discussion, course administration, and management of course materials. Uh, is is a is a real key, key use that we're excited to excited to see go forward here, and then uh, finally um, a web portal. Uh, so the ability to create a public or private or semi-private portal uh, to keep external stakeholders engaged without losing essential data privacy where it's needed, 
Um, so in this case, an international nonprofit could create a public facing web portal to connect you know, their donors and volunteers around the world with information about projects and volunteer opportunities and fundraising efforts, but not lose the ability to communicate as a team um, around, around things on the, on the inside uh, or, or private area of the web portal. Um, so those are a few of the use cases. Again, there's some, some really great opportunities ahead um, of Open Atrium. And in order to kind of dig into exactly what's there and what it all look, looks like, I will pass it over to uh, Mike Potter. Great. Thanks, Karen. Uh, and welcome to everybody. I'm going to try to go through uh, some of what Karen talked about in more detail and show you the features. Um, and then leave. Uh, I want to leave a bunch of time for, for questions at the end as well. Uh, and so um, Karen talked about this uh, a little bit, touched on some of the history with development seed, um, using Atrium and developing Atrium 1.0 uh, and what it was used for. Uh, the, the problem, of course, with Atrium 1.0 is it was done in Drupal 6, uh, which is reaching its end of life. And, and also it was fairly um, inflexible in terms of, of what it could do. It was designed for kind of a single use case, which was that internet use case. And, and people found it uh, difficult to customize, although certainly people did. Uh, so in moving forward, when we started looking at Atrium 2, uh, obviously we wanted to move forward with Drupal 7. Uh, and when we discussed you know, whether we would just port the old Atrium or do something else, uh, what we really decided to do was uh, really start from the ground up and try to build the best-in-class collaboration uh, toolkit uh, and framework in Drupal 7 today. So uh, we wanted to make it more flexible so it didn't have a single use case. Uh, and Karen touched upon some of the, the new use cases that, we can, uh, that it's being used for and we can see it being used for. Um, we wanted to make it more than just you know, uh, an out-of-the-box tool, but make it very easy to add plugins. Um, we really tried to focus on using the best-in-class Drupal solutions that were already out there. So rather than trying to write everything from scratch ourselves, uh, one of our design mantras was proudly invented elsewhere. Uh, which is let's take some technology that other people have developed. So for example, this is the first, uh, or, or it was the first, there's now many, uh, but this distribution is actually based upon the Monopoly distribution, uh, which is another Drupal distribution. If you haven't seen it, it's uh, based upon panels and provides a really good system for doing custom layout and really improves the content editor experience quite a bit. So by building on Panoply, we don't have to do things like the WYSIWYG ourselves. Uh, we can just use use the work that they've that they've used. Um, the the theme we've also tried to make it very easy to customize. And again, looking at the probably invented elsewhere, we actually looked outside of the Drupal community. So rather than picking a, a particular Drupal theme like Omega or Zen or Adaptive theme, um, we decided that we wanted to do something that was based on Bootstrap. Uh, Bootstrap is a CSS framework uh, that exists outside of Drupal. It was developed by Twitter. Uh, and it makes it really easy to write um, really responsive sites at the mobile first uh, uh, framework. So you get mobile functionality out of the box. Um, gives you a lot of good JavaScript functionality that's easy to tie in with your theme layer. And really helps us separate the look and feel from the functionality of the site so that it's really a lot easier to change the look and feel. So in the feature set, this is uh, what Atrium looks like out of the box right now. This is actually the first screen that we'll see when we install Atrium. Um, and so to dive into a, to this a little bit, you know, it gives you a few links to get some more help. Um, but the, the feature set, Karen gave you this little graphical view of some of the features. Uh, this is kind of a text, my text version of the same thing. And this is what each of my slides is going to cover here. So I'm going to have a slide on each of these topics so that we can uh, dig a little deeper into the specific functionality. So let's start with the security and data, data privacy. Um, let's see, actually, before we, before we do that, let's, I want to talk about some terminology. Um, this can be a challenge sometimes. We did change some of the terminology between the old Atrium 1, if you are familiar with that, to Atrium 2. We tried to look at other collaboration tools in the space and, and see what, what other terms people were using for various things. So we kind of split things into these categories, where first, you know, let's look at the people uh, the, the users of your site. And so we're using three terms here. Uh, we have a member, and a member is really just any user of your site. Uh, it can, it, it's a member that has access to your different content across the site. Uh, 
And then you have groups, which are collections of users that span across multiple content areas. So groups are large collections of users. It might be based upon role. Uh, so you might have, like, for example, the executive management group. Um, it might be regional based. You might have your, you know, California group or you know European group. Uh, it could also be, you know, based upon kind of your job function. You might have a developers group or a, a group of HR uh, representatives, that type of thing. So these are groups that span across your entire site. And then we have teams, and teams are an ad hoc collection of users specific to a single area of your site, which we're, which we're calling a space. Uh, so a team would be, for example, let's say that you have an area of your site uh, dedicated to a specific project. Uh, so the members of that area are, are, are members of that project. But you want to kind of spin up a team of three people, maybe it's like a working group is a good way to think of it, to work on a specific problem. So you can create these little ad hoc teams and, and throw members into that team. And you can create private areas of a site that only that team can access. Uh, so it's really easy to, to create teams and, and remove teams as needed. The structure of the site, the actual content, uh, is collected in these spaces. And the analogy that we're using here is uh, a filing cabinet. If you think of one of the big archaic filing cabinets uh, that some people still have in their offices, uh, think of a space as being that entire cabinet of stuff. Uh, and then within that filing cabinet, you can have subspaces, and a subspace would be like one of the drawers of the filing cabinet. Uh, and unlike physical filing cabinets, of course, in, in Atrium, you can have as many subspaces as you want, and you can have subspaces of subspaces of subspaces. So there's a whole hierarchy of content available. Uh, and then once you actually drill into one of those uh, filing cabinet drawers or subspaces, then your content actually lives in sections. And sections are like your folders uh, within that drawer. And these folders, can be uh, controlled uh, very, very uh, granularly. The, the access controls are very rich on this. So imagine that you have different colors of folders, and the red folders can only be seen by the executive team, and the yellow folders can only be seen by HR, uh, things like that. So that folder level at the sections is where all of the access control is happening. And that's a really key thing to get in Atrium, is that the content of your site all lives ultimately within one of these section folders. And the access to that content is based upon the folder that that content lives in. So it's really just like, it's very analogous to, to physical documents. You, know, you can imagine having a physical document, that document might be rated you know, top secret with all the stamps across the top, uh, and you would normally put it in a top secret folder that is controlled in your vault and safe. If you leave that document out on an open table somewhere, it's no longer top secret, it's public. And it's the same thing in Atrium. If you put content in a private section, then it's controlled and it's private. But if you publish that content into a public uh, section, it's visible to everybody. So that gets to the permissions where you can have public, private, or a mixed mode. So for example, what the mixed mode is, is within your space or your subspace, you can have both private sections and public sections. So that means that the space itself has mixed access, and people are only going to ever see what they have access to. So if you have private content and I'm not allowed to, to access that content, I'll never even see it, uh, even in search results or no matter how else I browse the site. And then the content itself, these are like the pieces of paper that live within the folders. And these are your actual documents, your events in your calendar, your discussion forum your work tracker issues and, and those types of things, any type of, any type of Drupal content. In fact, you can create your own content types uh, and add them into sections. So that's the terminology that we're going to use. This is a, kind of a, another graphical picture that takes a little bit to, to get a feeling for, because you're actually kind of looking at a filing cabinet from the side with all the drawers pulled out and then the folders within the drawers. Um, we probably need to, to color this in some way to make it a little bit easier to understand. But, but here you can see that you know, we have drawers for things like you know, the employee resources where the, only the employees of the company can see the certain folders. Um, you know, we have the HR space where the salary information is protected, uh, but the policies are open uh, and that kind of stuff. So this is that kind of mixed access control and how spaces 
subspaces and sections all come together. So as an example, if you're looking at the corporate internet site, uh, you might split each region into its own space. You might have like the North America region, the Asia region, and then you'd have subspaces for your specific offices or locations, like the New York office lives within the North America space. You might have groups of people. You might have a group for your employees and a separate group for managers and a separate group for executives. And then the actual sections within each of those uh, offices would be used for the department. So you would have like your employee discussion section. You might have private sections for manager discussions, um, kind of an open events calendar and so on. And then you would use teams within those sections for specific you know, working groups or project specific uh, teams. So hopefully that's that's clear. Um, that is then how I mentioned some of this already. That's how we implement the security and data data privacy. Then is at that section level. So a given section can be given access to groups, teams, or individual users. So if I create a section and I assign the management group to it, only the management group can see that section. Um, if I assign a project team to it, only that project team can see that section. So these can be freely mixed. Uh, this also fully integrates with any identity management system you might have uh, through LDAP. So we have full LDAP integration where existing groups in LDAP get pulled in and become groups within Open Atrium. Um, and you can do user login through LDAP uh, and, and so on. And I talk a little bit more about identity management in a little bit. Um, as I mentioned, it is fully hierarchical. hierarchical. <laughs> I can't talk today. So uh, there's spaces and subspaces and sub subspaces. Um, so that just allows you to create a, a hierarchical website, as shown in that bottom left picture. But then beyond that, <clears throat> each space can actually have multiple parents. So one subspace can be the subspace of different spaces. And that's what gives you this multi-dimensional hierarchy, which is another common uh, information architecture model that uh, websites have. You can uh, fully control inheritance across those, uh, that, those subgroups. <coughs> Excuse me. So for example, you can control, if, if somebody is the administrator of a parent space, you can control whether or not in the subspace they still have administrator access or not. Uh, because different uh, use cases have different needs for that. So on the right-hand side, you can see another example of that corporate internet that I was talking about, the different regions and the different offices. So the user interface uh, is based on the Bootstrap theme that I talked about, the Bootstrap framework, which uh, gives us a mobile-friendly, tablet-friendly site. Uh, you can see on the right what happens when you collapse the site into a mobile uh, you kind of get the little menu buttons along the top. Uh, the upper right button there lets you actually slide out the sidebar, uh, stuff like that. So it's actually more than just a responsive theme. Uh, it actually has some built-in mobile-specific logic for dealing with like swiping out the sidebars and, and that kind of thing. Um, along the top there, um, you'll see at the very top is kind of the header to the site where you've got your logo and your main menu. Uh, and then below that is the main navigation of the site. Uh, the, the first little admin button is the Drupal admin menu, if you have access to that. So most users are not going to see that. Uh, only your admins will see that. And then you've got your home button. Uh, the drop down next to the home button shows you all the spaces that you're subscribed to. And then here it shows us that we're actually uh, looking at the physics space within the physical sciences parent space. So you can always see kind of one level up from where you are. So it acts kind of like a breadcrumb. Uh, we actually call it a, a navigational breadcrumb because it acts as a breadcrumb, but you can also use the drop-down menu to navigate. So for example, the drop-down next to physical sciences <coughs> excuse me, lets you see other subspaces other than physics. The drop-down next to physics lets you see the various sections that you have within your space. And then the little question mark icon is for the, the tours. We have a full kind of interactive tutorial system. Uh, based upon a, a module called Bootstrap Tour that lets you learn about functionality, gives you little pop-ups. It's kind of like if you've ever played with Joyride. Uh, it's like Joyride functionality for your website. 
So we ship with some two words to teach you about Atrium. Uh, but you can also use the same functionality yourself when you're building the site to give your own users uh, site-specific help uh, about the site that you're building for them. Uh, the little plus button is our contextual content creation button. What that means is that's where you go to add content. So you click on that and you'll see you know, add event or add post. Uh, but it's contextual in the sense that it's smart. It knows where you are on the site. So if you're within a calendar section, it's going to let you add events. If you're within a discussion forum, it lets you add discussion posts. Um, and we'll automatically try to figure out where stuff goes uh, based on what you're creating. Uh, the star icon is for favorite spaces. And then we have the search bar, which lets you search across the entire site or only within the current space or across users. And then finally, you've got your little user badge with your username and your profile picture. And that lets you access your uh, dashboard and profile. All of this is customizable. You can see we've got kind of a purple theme here. Every space can have its own customizable colors and banners and menus. So then when you're within a space, uh, the entire layout of that space landing page is customizable. And in fact, every space, subspace, and section page is customizable like this. And this is using Panoply. And as I mentioned, Panoply is based upon the panels, modules, and Drupal, and Panelizer. So you get these buttons at the top of your page that say Customize Layout and Customize Page. The a Customize Layout lets you choose the region layout of your space. And so down in the lower right-hand corner there, I've shown you uh, kind of little thumbnails of all 31 uh, responsive layouts. So whether you want the sidebar on the right or the sidebar on the left, or you want three columns or two columns or four columns, uh, all of that is configurable on a per space and per section page basis. And then once you've selected that region layout, when you customize the page, you get this interface shown in, on the right-hand side uh, in the, the upper portion there, where you can now drag and drop these widgets around. So every little box on the page is called a widget. And you'll see that in the upper right corner of each box, uh, there is a drag and drop uh, button that you can use to drag it around and change the order. Uh, there's a plus button that you can use to add more widgets. Uh, there's dozens of widgets that come with Atrium for adding various views of content. Uh, a lot of the widgets are very uh, general purpose. So you can drop in some customized views and then change it to show a table format versus teaser layout. You can change the columns in the table um, and so forth. So a lot, of, a lot of flexibility there. You can also customize a lot of these view widgets as to whether or not they show you just the content of the space you're in or whether they also roll up content from subspaces. So for example, if you have a recent event widget, uh, you can control whether that shows only the recent event within the current space or within all of the subspaces as well. So you could put, for example, a regional event uh, calendar on a page just by clicking that option. So lots and lots of customization options there. Uh, for user identity management, I mentioned our LDAP integration a little bit. Um, we've enhanced it a bit over the regular LDAP module. You can actually authenticate based on either username or email address. Uh, it automatically uh, populates the spaces and groups uh, with the members from the LDAP group. Um, it also supports write back, which means instead of managing your user group via LDAP directly, if you, you can enable it such that if you change the membership of users on your Atrium site, that that new membership gets written back to your LDAP group. So you can actually allow people to manage your LDAP groups from Drupal and Atrium. It also supports what we call a mixed mode, uh, which is if the when the user logs in, if that login matches a local Drupal account, you'll go ahead and log in locally. If it doesn't match a local Drupal account, then it will check with the LDAP Active Directory service uh, to log in via uh, that identity management system. So this allows you to support both uh, kind of locked down user management um, but have a mixed site where you can also have authenticated public users that have Drupal accounts that aren't necessarily part of your LDAP system. And again, that's all customizable. Um, you, can, you can turn off mixed mode if you want. So in terms of the specific plugins that come with Atrium, well, the first one is the discussion plugin. plugin. Uh, this is your basic discussion forum. Um, uh, I say basic, uh, but it's actually pretty functional. We're not using the forum module in Drupal. We actually rolled our own uh, forum system for this. Um, specifically, the replies to a post 
are the same Drupal content type as the original post itself. This lets you easily promote replies. If somebody replies and it's really an important topic and you want to promote it to a top level topic, uh, you change, you edit that and change one pointer and it uh, becomes top level. Makes it really easy to move stuff around between different sections and spaces. Um, as you'll see here on the right hand side, the replies to a post are collapsed once you've seen them. Uh, so it only shows you, it will automatically expand any new replies. And then the next time you view the node, those get collapsed. And you can click on those replies and those will expand and collapse to show you the actual content of the replies. So again, it just helps you kind of reduce the noise, uh, lets you focus on the new stuff that you want to focus on. Along those same lines, uh, we have full attachment and multimedia support. So you can attach documents, images, spreadsheets, everything else that you want. Um, what happens sometimes is you get a very long discussion going on and different replies, people have posted various documents along the way. And with all of the replies being collapsed, it's hard to kind of find all those, all those uh, documents. So we have this media widget in the upper right hand corner that aggregates all of the attachments that have been made to this discussion thread and puts it in a single place. So you can see that reply number two had that drawing. Reply number three posted a little markup. And you can click on those and it will open up in a little light box pop up to let you look at the full image or download the PDF file or whatever it is that's there. Uh, we also have a full notification system here. Uh, notifications are a core part of Atrium that apply to all content types. So I'm just talking about it here in terms of discussion, uh, but it's going to apply to all the other plugins that we talk about. Uh, there's two types of notifications supported natively in Atrium. Um, the first one that I call a poll notification means that I'm browsing the site and I see data I'm interested in or content I'm interested in, and I want to be notified when that content is updated. So I'm going to click the subscribe button. Uh, so it's kind of like the Facebook follow button. And when I subscribe to it, now I'm pulling those updates to me. I'm going to get emails whenever that's updated. But we also support what I call a push notification, which is as the creator of this content, you know, if I'm working on a particular project team, you know, I know that the project team is going to need to be notified about this content. So as I'm creating this discussion thread, I can fill in a group, a team, or set of users over there in that notification widget, and they will get automatically notified whenever this content is changed or when there's a reply to it. So in this example, you can see I've selected the faculty group. This isn't going to notify everybody in the entire faculty. It's only going to notify the faculty members who are members of the particular space that I'm in. Uh, in this case, I'm in the physics space, so it's only going to notify the physics faculty. And they're going to get an email every time somebody replies to this post. Uh, in that notification system, we also now support daily and weekly digest emails. So if you don't want to be kind of spammed by by all of this email, you can switch on digest and get these uh, updates just once a day or once a week. Now, the WYSIWYG is a tiny MCE. It's a fully WYSIWYG editor. Um, we also have support for the Markdown language if you want to do more of a, a wiki kind of language. Uh, and then finally, if you do get one of these notifications that says, you know, hey, Karen just responded to your post, and you get an email about that, uh, we support email reply back. So in your email client, you can actually reply to a post, and your reply will actually get sent back into Atrium and get posted as an official uh, reply node. And then notifications for that reply will go out to everybody who's, who's subscribed or being notified. So it's really a pretty powerful uh, discussion forum system. Um, it's certainly not going to be the world's best discussion forum. And that's, in general, in Atrium, you're not going to find the best of class plugin uh, for any of these things. You're going to find you know, pretty good functionality. And the intent is if you need to integrate with the best-in-class solution for you know, document management or forums, that Atrium has the tools to do that integration or to help you with that integration. Uh, so the next piece is knowledge management. Uh, this is your basic wiki kind of uh, thing. And Karen mentioned this in terms of the, the documentation site. The main difference here is uh, that there's no replies. Uh, you can turn on normal Drupal comments if you want. Uh, but there's also this hierarchy menu shown on the right. So for any content within your section, you can place it into a section-specific uh, menu, and you can then navigate that menu structure to find content. So really good for forming uh, you know, complex knowledge databases. Uh, it, again, these support notifications. They support the full multimedia. 
So instead of being wiki documents, these could be pointers to uh, PDF uploads or Excel spreadsheet uploads. Uh, and you still have the full kind of public and private uh, section uh, access control on here. Event management is another area where HPM goes pretty deep. Um, it's, uh, there's an event content type. Uh, events have the normal date model kind of thing. So you can have uh, multi-day events, uh, all-day events. You can have repeating events. You can have meetings on the you know, third Friday of every month. Um, you know, all of that kind of functionality is there out of the box. Uh, we support color coding of events on calendars either based on taxonomy or what section and space uh, the event is in. Um, and then when, when, we, when we look at the location, the events are more than just a, a date and time. They also have a location. And these days, locations aren't just physical locations. They're also virtual locations. So here I've shown an example where uh, in that lower group meeting, I've given it a location of Alexandria, Virginia. And then it says webinar is at www.gotomeeting.com. So rather than using something like the address field in Drupal, where you have to fill out the street address and the zip code and the county and the state and you know, all those different fields, uh, we simply have a single uh, text field. It's a free text field. And you can fill in pretty much anything that Google uh, can recognize. So we're using Google's uh, geocoder and the geofield module for this. Uh, there are other providers other than Google that you can select them if you need to. Um, but basically, you fill in an address like Alexandria, Virginia, and it's going to give you a map, uh, and it's going to find that location, even if you don't specify zip codes and things like that. Uh, and then it has a way to split off the virtual data. So when it says webinar at gotomeeting.com, uh, that data is not parsed by Google. It just comes straight as your uh, you know, like virtual meeting link. Uh, we also have the support for something called Add This Event, which is that Add to Calendar button. So when you click on an event, you can click Add to Calendar and put it on your Google Calendar. Uh, it supports Google, Outlook, and general iCal uh, formats. Uh, every calendar has an iCal link at the bottom to export the entire calendar. And then we also have iCal import functionality. So you can create an import uh, content node, give it the URL to a Google Calendar. It will pull all of those events into Drupal. And then on your cron uh, update task, it will update those events uh, with changes from Google as needed. So it is kind of a poll only. Uh, if you make the change in Google, that change will show up in Drupal uh, after your cron job runs. But if you edit the event in Drupal, uh, that does not get written back to Google. Uh, there is a, we're using a, a module here called Full Calendar, which is different than the older calendar module in Drupal. Uh, full Calendar has uh, much more modern uh, interface support that people are used to. So there's full drag and drop support. If you have access to create events, you can drag these events to a different day. Uh, if you switch to the weekly view, you can change their times and move them around uh, just like you do in Google Calendar. And there is a method in full calendar uh, to create a fully live bi-directional link with Google Calendar uh, if you want to do that. We don't have that surfaced in Atrium out of the box, but the module itself does do that. You just have to create a custom view for that. So very rich uh, calendaring uh, functionality here. Then we have the uh, work tracker. This is the replacement for case tracker from HTML1. And it's your basic issue tracking system. And again, you're not going to see a uh, full-fledged like JIRA uh, bug tracking system here. It's just a basic to-do task list kind of thing. Uh, but it allows you to set up uh, different sections for your projects. Um, it lets you change the status information. If you're kind of used to how Drupal.org used to work in the issue queue, this will seem very familiar. Uh, as, you as you reply to a, a, a task, you can change its status and who it's assigned to and what its priority is. Again, supports full multimedia attachments, the full notification system, um, all of those other things that come from uh, Atrium. Uh, to, to extend Atrium is very easy. Uh, Atrium is pure Drupal. Uh, we're using a lot of modules. There's about 180 Drupal modules in Atrium right now. Uh, some of those were written custom for Atrium, but most of those are community modules. Uh, and then we wrote some glue to make it all work together. Uh, anything that integrates with organic groups is going to work pretty much out of the box. Um, it, we also, you know, if it supports panels and monopoly, it's going to work pretty well. Uh, this is, you know, if you're not supporting panels, if you're using more of a context than boxes, uh, type of architecture, you might have a little bit more trouble integrating. 
um, because we are panels based. Uh, but we're fully compatible with views, uh, any custom content types you create, any custom entities, uh, et cetera. Uh, basically, for the developers out there, if you go into your content type, you add these two fields, the, the space reference and the section reference. You add those to your content type, and now your content type is going to be fully integrated with Atrium. It's going to support all of the access control rule. It's going to support notifications and all the other core features. So you get a lot for very little work. And then building those widgets, um, the widgets are just panels themed, if you're familiar with panels. You can create them via the views module. Um, you can create them just static pages via the customized page. If you just want to add an image to your page or a, a link list of links or a video, you can do that right now through the static content customization. Um, you can also create custom uh, panels in code. You can also create mini panels uh, within Google itself work as, as widgets. So lots of customization possibilities using the uh, Plopo system. So just finishing up here, and then we'll have uh, about 15 minutes for questions. Um, so our roadmap in terms of where we're going, we just, you know, as Claire mentioned, we released uh, version 2. We released OpenHVM 2.0 at BATCAMP. Um, we're actually at 2.09 right now. We're going to have 2.1 next week, which does have some uh, security updates. They just released a new version of Drupal this week. Uh, 7.24, so we're going to be uh, putting that into Atrium next week. So we're obviously going to continue the maintenance and support of Atrium. Um, right now that's through the Drupal issue queue. So if you have kind of technical questions, that's really the best place to go. Go to drupal.org slash project slash open Atrium. I'll throw a link later for that. Um, but just use the issue queue there to report bugs uh, or ask support questions. Uh, we're going to provide some migration examples from OA1. Uh, but of course, OE1 is Drupal 6, so there's uh, no magic button to automatically convert your Drupal 6 site into Drupal 7, uh, unfortunately. The features that are kind of in the roadmap for the future are some uh, chat, instant message, private messaging, uh, some improved uh, workflow where you actually have approval chains, uh, more social media tools for following users, uh, some real-time collaboration where you can do like real-time editing like you do with Google Docs where you can see each other's cursor, um, and more integration with document management systems. And you'll see this plugin functionality uh, get moved into the uh, apps uh, world where you can easily turn uh, these plugins on and off as needed uh, in your site. So as I mentioned, uh, and Karen mentioned, you can go download it right now from Google.org. So there's that link to the project page I was mentioning. That's where the issue queue is. There's also a whole bunch of other webinars linked on that page if you want to listen to some older uh, webinars when we're developing Atrium, showcasing some of the features. I actually give some demos in that. Atrium has gotten so large now that doing a demo in less than an hour and a half is difficult. So that's why I kind of went through slides today. But some of the other webinars that are linked on that page show you actual hands-on demos uh, with, the, with the tool. As Karen mentioned, you can also get it on Pantheon. If you go to getpantheon.com slash openatrium, you can install and spin up a, an Atrium site really easily there. So here's your resources for learning more. Uh, the docs.openatrium.com is where the documentation is that Karen mentioned. Uh, we've got the webinars on the, product, the project page. We have an IRC room. Uh, and that's our email address if you want to contact us for kind of more in-depth uh, training needs. So with that, I want to go out of full screen here and open it up for questions. Wow, thanks, Mike, uh, and and thanks, Karen. That was a uh, a lot of uh, a lot of exciting information in a short time. Um, <laughs> yes. And uh, now it's it's good to see uh, how how this all fit together. And I'm sure there were like months and months of of agonizing deliberation on you know on on what to what to do with the new the new version, and uh, so it, it looks uh, really great. So um, I will uh, uh, ask anyone who has a question, please uh, speak up. And if you're muted, uh, you have to unmute to do that. So. Hey, Bruce and Mike, I, I have one. Um, so I'm uh, we're thinking the Drupal group of building a kind of um, issue tracker to keep track of things we'd like to contribute to to pull forward um, scientific uses of Drupal. So if I wanted to write that as an app for OpenAtria, 
um, so that it could be made available to other distributions of OpenEdition. Is there a um, are there guidelines for how to do that right now, or do we have to wait till the app server comes out? Uh, nope. Right now, um, we've got some documentation out on the doc site. Um, the technical documentation on creating plugins, I'm actually going to be expanding and moving that to Google.org so that we're going to have a notebook section uh, from the project page. When you Right now, when you click Read Documentation, it sends you to the doc site. Uh, we'll be changing that so that it goes to the Google's uh, notebook area and has a little bit more documentation there. And it will have some of the, uh, the kind of technical guidelines on it on how to do this. Um, that's why we call it plugin right now and not app. Uh, and a plugin is basically just a module. So it really is, it really is as simple as making a module. Um, if you're doing uh, like work tracking stuff, um, the work tracker module, for example, kind of existed before outside of Atrium. And really all he had to do was add that section field and space field to his content type uh, and then adjust some of his views uh, and, and that was really the work involved in integrating with Atrium. So uh, it is really very straightforward. Most of your work will be just the regular Drupal work of building the module and your content types and, and things like that. And then the Atrium integration will be pretty simple. Once we actually get down to doing apps, uh, it really depends upon what app model we end up picking uh, and, and how we end up handling that. Our kind of vision in the future is that we'll be able to spin up multiple servers both globally and locally. So you'd be able to access, for example, the Drupal.org uh, app server to look for general purpose apps. But then you'll be able to spin up your own, for example, you know, NASA app store uh, where you can kind of lock it down and you know, put scientific applications and those kinds of things there for just your users. So that's kind of where it's going in the future. But you can definitely get started now by just writing a module and doing a quick integration. Right, thanks. That, that really helps. Um, one other question is about the um, Radix theme that you're using. I yep. think. Um, so I was I read the module page and it, it seemed to say so it uses Bootstrap, but is it a full implementation of Bootstrap, or does it just use? <laughs> nope, it's a full implementation of Bootstrap uh, 2.1. Um, so we haven't gone to Bootstrap 3 because they just changed so much in Bootstrap 3 that it was going to break everything that people have done. Uh, so maybe in the future we'll have a version 3 alternate selection, but we'll still have the, the current one. Um, and yeah, the theme you refer to, Radix, um, is a Bootstrap-based theme on Plopoly. The, the only difference between it and regular Bootstrap, uh, which is actually an advantage, is uh, Bootstrap is normally done using the less compiler. And we prefer using a tool called Compass. Uh, which is a Ruby SAS compiler. And so Radix actually is using the Compass or SAS version of Bootstrap. Um, and if that's all gobbledygook, baby, basically SAS is just like a compiler for CSS. So it lets you do you know, modern things like put your colors into a variable and then use that variable across your theme so you only have to change your color in one place um, and kind of structure your CSS a little bit better. Um, we do use both the CSS and the JavaScript. So a lot of the functionality in Atrium, like the toolbar, is provided by the Bootstrap JavaScript library. So if you do implement a theme that's not Bootstrap-based, you might still have to include the Bootstrap JavaScript for some of the functionality to continue working, um, unless you replace that as well. So um, but yeah, Bootstrap components, right? Yeah, yeah, it should be very easy to use anything that works with Bootstrap 2.1 on that. Awesome. Thank and you then, very and much. Then, and really then, great work. Thanks. And then just a little bit beyond that, the other thing we tried to do to make it easier to kind of theme, everything uh, that's a view has a template TPL file. So if you don't like, like for example, the recent activity screen uh, that shows you the activity that's been posted to a space, that's just a view with a template. You can copy that template file into your own theme and then change the HTML markup. Uh, so it's really, really easy to change. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Really easy to change the HTML markup of almost anything in Atria. Should it be easy to change the kind of global layout markup at the, say, for the top bar? Um, yeah, there's also a page template file, and you can definitely override that as well. The things like the toolbar are actually a mini panel. Uh, that's rendered and placed on the page. 
So you can actually rearrange stuff in the toolbar uh, via the Drupal UI for mini panels without even getting into the theme layer. Uh, same thing with the footer. If you want to throw a widget into the footer or rearrange the footer, uh, you can do that just through the Drupal UI without writing any theme code. Wow, that's fantastic. Thanks. Really useful information. I appreciate it. See, Pam has a question uh, about notifications. He says, I only seem to be able to choose actual groups and not space members. Is there a way to choose space members? Um, so yeah, in notifications, there's, there's uh, those three fields. One is for group, one is for team, and one is for users. Uh, so you can choose groups uh, in the groups, and you're right. That currently doesn't let you select a space yet. Um, you can't add people from other spaces. Uh, notifications are only going to go to members of your current space. So as I showed in that example where I added the faculty group, it's not going to send a notification to everybody in the faculty group. It's only going to send notifications to people who are in the faculty group who are also members of my space. So it doesn't actually make sense to put another space there because they aren't members of your current space. Um, the users field is where you can select individual members of your current space. Uh, if you want to use them directly, although we generally recommend if you're going to do that to uh, go ahead and create a little team uh, within your space and then notify that team. Yeah, and you can't do your current space, and that's, uh, that is actually something that's going to get fixed. There's going to be a checkbox that says basically notify everybody in the space. Um, we realized that recently that, that, yeah, if you want to notify everybody, there was like no way to do that. Uh, so there's going to be a checkbox for that very soon. Cool. Okay. Open it up to anybody else next. Uh, you know, this this comes out uh, about four months or six months after Drupal Commons 2.0. Uh, yeah. You guys want to say, you know, what? Why is this so much better than Drupal Commons? <laughs> well, um, but my my real answer is I I leave that as a exercise for the student to uh, evaluate both products and. Pick the one that best meets your need, um, because obviously, if you talk to me, I'm going to be biased, and if you talk to Aquia, they're going to be biased, and probably anybody you talk to in the Drupal community is going to be biased one way or the other. Um, I, I can speak to a couple big differences. Um, the main use case differences is Commons was designed to be a social collaboration platform. Uh, if you use something like like Yammer or Jive. That's really the use case they're going for. It's like a Facebook for your company. Atrium is much more focused on project collaboration, team collaboration, and intranet kind of systems. So as an example, if I'm on a project and I've got a collaboration tool for my project, if let, let's say I'm on a project and the client that I'm doing the project for is also a member of that collaboration system because you want to collaborate with your client, right? So you know the client posts an issue to your issue tracker saying, hey, there's this bug that you need to go fix. I don't really care how many people like that. It's a bug. I have to go fix it, right? I need to be able to go in and see the status information of that project uh, on more of a real-time basis. And I don't really care about people liking things or following things and, and that kind of stuff. So, so that's just kind of one distinction is the main use case there. Um, you'll find that there's, uh, I think, a bit more depth in the Atrium product in a lot of areas. For example, the event calendars with the, the actual the, having a calendar and not just an event content type, um, having location of events. Um, the discussion forum is more in depth. Um, so there's just a lot more kind of functionality in the individual features. Uh, where Commons does a bit better right now is in that it has a little bit more social media tools. For example, right now in Atrium, you can follow content, but you can't easily follow a user. Uh, so you know that's something that we're planning to improve and update, uh, but isn't out of the box right now. But you know, ultimately, even though yeah, Atrium two came out a few months after Common three, but of course, Atrium one's been around for a long, long time, and you know, Commons was was certainly looking at Atrium way back when when they first uh, built that. So they've always been kind of having this healthy uh, competition, which is fun because they're both Drupal and they're both open source, you know, so 
you know, I'm sure when I do something in Atrium, the common guys look at it and, and add that to their distribution and, and vice versa. Uh, we're certainly both using panels. We're both using organic groups. So there's a lot of common functionality on the architecture. The other, the other huge difference actually is in the entire uh, data access and permissioning system. Um, this whole concept of a section, uh, they don't have that. Uh, they have the standard organic groups, public or private, but it applies to an entire group. So the ability to have uh, a space in Atrium and have a mixed mode where you can have some private sections and some public sections and control that you know, via LDAP or, or through Teams, that's something that's very unique to Atrium. And that's where the actual core code is. Like, if you look at the distributions and see where did they actually write a lot of custom code as opposed to just using modules like panels, uh, most of the custom code in Atrium is around that access control model, um, making it work with the Drupal private file system, for example, so that when you post an attachment, to a discussion post, if that discussion post is private, your attachment also becomes private. And there's no magic URL you can use to go view that, that attachment. So it's really right. heavily tied in with the, uh, the Drupal's uh, node grant system and everything. Uh, and that's something, again, that the Commons does not, to, does not do. Let's see, Pam actually asks, can we bulk add members to a space? Um, right now, not directly out of the box, although there are modules in Drupal for doing bulk user loads. And I believe Organic Groups has integration with the, uh, the Views bulk upload module, which lets you select a whole bunch of users and, and add them to a, to a group or space. So that would still work. Um, we don't have any specific atrium interface around that to be easier. Also, spaces support LDAP as well as groups. So if you already have uh, an, an external LDAP or Active Directory system, um, you can just assign that to a space and it will automatically pick up those members uh, automatically. You don't have to actually assign them directly. OK, I, this is Bruce again. Just one quick question on, on uh, you know, you, you've done great work with the discussion section. Um, uh, any any thoughts about doing something uh, on a Q and A or uh, sort of uh, staff exchange kind of? Uh... <laughs> yeah, I, I see that. I, I group that with what I call some of these social social features where you want to be able to basically rate uh, rate responses and have the best answers uh, percolate to the top, uh, like uh, Stack Overflow does. Um, I think that's definitely on the roadmap. Uh, right now, we do integrate with the Drupal 5-star module, uh, so you can turn that on and start to rate content that way. Um, but the, the recent activity river that we have right now uh, doesn't currently do sorting by, by relevance. It's currently purely date-based. Um, Commons is using a module called the radioactivity module uh, that we're going to be looking at as well. It's just another Drupal module for handling kind of relevance and uh, point, has a point system. Uh, yeah. So I think we're going to be looking at, at all of those kinds of things. Uh, for for now, the you know the focus was to kind of keep the replies in purely chronological order. Uh, the other thing I should mention is we don't support um, through the UI having replies to replies. So it's a single threaded discussion. Um, there's some good technical and social reasons for not doing like a Reddit uh, reply to reply system. Uh, on the other hand, the way it's actually implemented is. Uh, a given reply just has a parent, and that parent can be another reply or the original post. There's nothing actually preventing it from being another reply. It's just that it won't get displayed properly in the current view that's uh, used to output that. Okay, we've kept you uh, kept you over. Any any final questions? Let's see, Pam asked another final question. I read that inherited members from inherited spaces don't have full member permissions. Is that true? Um, no, that's actually not true. Um, so there is a distinction in Atrium between, as I mentioned, there's this kind of hierarchy of spaces. So if you're a member, a member of a parent space, you automatically become a member of the subspaces. There's actually a control to enable that. It's enabled by default. Um, but there's a distinction between access to a space 
and membership in the space. So you can control uh, in organic groups. There's permissions per space, so you can control what members can do. Um, by default, your inherited members will act as members in terms of being able to create content. But when you actually display the members, there's a widget that shows you like who your members are in a space. Right now, that widget is only showing you direct membership. So even though you might be a member of a parent space, it's not going to necessarily show you up directly. That's actually on purpose. There's some use cases where you want to give like a wide variety of people access to a space, like your executive team. Um, but you want to distinguish that from people who are kind of active participants. Uh, think of like a working group, and you want the members to show the actual members of the working group, not everyone who has read access to the, to the space. So there's some distinction there. Um, but uh, in terms of pulling uh, members, oh, if you, yeah, if you want it to go the reverse way, if you want the parent space to pull members from subspaces, um, that's currently only the other direction. There's some patches to the uh, OG subgroup module that we're looking at to support um, inheritance both ways. Um, but right now, it's just one way. But what we do for that is that, that's why we have separation between spaces and groups. So if you actually put your members into groups and subgroups and then make those subgroups parents of your space, that actually can work. And I know that kind of sounds weird until you think about it a little bit, but, but play with that a little bit. Spaces and groups, um, kind of one inherits down and one inherits up. Um, so you can't put space members in a group. Right, so that's why you basically put everybody into groups and then you assign different groups to spaces. Um, but anyway, we could, you know, feel free to post to the Drupal ACQ um, with that. There's definitely some other people talking about this inheritance. Inheritance gets very tricky. That's one of the other things, by the way, Commons doesn't have, uh, is they don't have support for the <coughs> OG subgroups module. <coughs> Excuse me. And this inheritance thing gets very, very tricky, uh, very, very complicated. I think our automated testing that we run whenever we do a build test something like 300 different access control cases of you know, inherited members and subspaces and spaces, trying to make sure that all the access rules still work. And so so it, it get, definitely gets tricky. And, and we'll be working on improving that as the use cases come up that people need. So cool. All right. Well, thank, thanks for having us. Did you have any closing comments you want to make, Karen? Or did, or did Karen, or did, Karen Pern had to drop off for another meeting. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> <All right. laughs> so, yeah, as I said, feel free to contact us or post to the ECQ. Post if you're on YouTube, post to the comments. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank everyone at, uh, at phase two, uh, not just for this call, but for obviously an enormous amount of thought and effort um, uh, that they put into uh, making this, this open source. Uh, Distribution available to uh, to us all, and uh, I, you know, it's it's a season of Thanksgiving, and boy, this is something we all can be really thankful for, um, and uh, we all really appreciate you uh, you being here for us. Cool, thanks, Bruce. Happy holidays.